Hear Martin Luther King Jr. picks up once more the question of how to live with shattered dreams. He asks, what then is the answer? The answer lies in our willing acceptance of unwanted and unfortunate circumstances, even as we still cling to a radiant hope. Our acceptance of finite disappointment, even as we adhere to infinite hope. This is not the grim, bitter acceptance of the fatalist, but the achievement found in Jeremiah's words, this is a grief and I must bear it. You must honestly confront your shattered dream. To follow the escapist method of attempting to put the disappointment out of your mind will lead to a psychologically injurious repression. Place your failure at the forefront of your mind and stare daringly at it. Ask yourself, how may I transform this liability into an asset? How may I, confined in some narrow Roman cell and unable to reach life's Spain, transmute this dungeon of shame into a haven of redemptive suffering? Almost anything that happens to us may be woven into the purposes of God. It may lengthen our cords of sympathy. It may break our self-centered pride. The cross, which was willed by wicked men, was woven by God into the tapestry of the world's redemption. Many of the world's most influential personalities have exchanged their thorns for crowns. Charles Darwin, suffering from a recurrent physical illness. Robert Louis Stevenson, plagued with tuberculosis. And Helen Keller, inflicted with blindness and deafness, responded not with bitterness or fatalism, but rather by the exercise of a dynamic will, transformed negative circumstances into positive assets. Writes the biographer of George Frederick Handel. His health and his fortunes had reached their lowest ebb. His right side had become paralyzed and his money was all gone. His creditors seized him and threatened him with imprisonment. For a brief time, he was tempted to give up the fight, but then he rebounded again to compose the greatest of his inspirations, the epic Messiah. The Hallelujah Chorus was born, not in a sequestered villa in Spain, but in a narrow, undesirable cell. How familiar is the experience of longing for Spain and settling for a Roman prison. And how less familiar the transforming of the broken remains of a disappointed expectation into opportunities to serve God's purpose. Yet powerful living always involves such victories over one's own soul and one's situation. We Negroes have long dreamed of freedom, but still we are confined in an oppressive prison of segregation and discrimination. Must we respond with bitterness and cynicism? Certainly not, for this will destroy and poison our personalities. Must we, by concluding that segregation is within the will of God, resign ourselves to oppression? Of course not, for this blasphemously attributes to God that which is of the devil. To cooperate passively with an unjust system 
makes the oppressed as evil as the oppressor. Our most fruitful course is to stand firm with courageous determination to move forward nonviolently amid obstacles and setbacks, accept disappointments, and cling to hope. Our determined refusal not to be stopped will eventually open the door of fulfillment. While still in this prison of segregation, we must ask how may we turn this liability into an asset by recognizing the necessity of suffering in a righteous cause, we may possibly achieve our humanity's full stature. To guard ourselves from bitterness, we need the vision to see in this generation's ordeals the opportunity to transfigure both ourselves and American society. Our present suffering and our nonviolent struggle to be free may well offer to Western civilization the kind of spiritual dynamic so desperately needed for survival.